for the time being, we'll just understand the Reshman syndrome can have a varying degree of uh, uterine lining fibrosis or Sinaiki. So, classically, what we say with Reshman syndrome. <laughs>
amenorrhea. Yes, all of you know about that. Amenorrhea is the classical presentation. So, just to be different, I think they did not give you the amenorrhea choice. They gave you dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia, oligomenorrhea and hypomenorrhea. So, yes, uh, we would go with hypomenorrhea because that is the other symptom. Hypomenorrhea, oligomenorrhea, not a classical presentation, but then that's also mentioned in the book. So, classically amenorrhea, next is hypomenorrhea and maybe oligomenorrhea. But in this question, they asked you about uh, hypomenorrhea. So, we'll say that the answer to question number two is A. So, now Eschermann syndrome is uh, additions in the endometrial cavity. It is associated with amenorrhea, infertility and very important even recurrent pregnancy losses. Because even if that endometrium uh, partly in some place, it is supporting an implantation rarely, but that area of the uterus will not have that kind of a blood supply which will support the embryo to continue its life. So that's why we say that even recurrent pregnancy loss, now that is something which is new for you to learn, okay. Recurrent pregnancy loss might be a presentation of Eschermann syndrome. Now how do we diagnose? The best diagnosis of Eschermann syndrome, yes you can make it by a hysterosalpingography like the question here, you can do it by a sonosalpingography. You can do it by ultrasonography if you, uh, you know, that's what we regularly do, you know, uh, regularly when we do ultrasounds, that's where we see these hyperechoic uh, areas in the uterine lining and that's how we usually diagnose Eschmann syndrome. But then yes, we can even diagnose by HSG or a sonosalpingogram. But yes, the best diagnosis is by a hysteroscopy, hysteroscopic I've been telling you uh, wherever you can enter, you know, all over the body, wherever you can enter with a scope, that is usually the best way of diagnosing a lesion of that area, okay. So, that holds good for ENT and for medicine and for surgery and for gynae, so many other uh, places, wherever you can enter with a scope, that's usually the best way of diagnosing that lesion, arthroscopy for so many lesions in the joints, all right. So, uh, the treatment, yes, treatment is uh, hysteroscopic adhesiolysis. Hysteroscopic adhesiolysis is the classical management and post of what do you want to do when you've done the adhesiolysis uh, you know you'll do uh, fine dissection of these adhesions and gentle scraping you know don't uh, uh, go ahead and start scraping all over again very hard because that was the reason which caused the Eschmann syndrome isn't it. So what we'll do we will do a gentle removal of the scars and we will do snipping of the adhesions so that uh, the surgery may bleed a little bit because you're trying to get the uh, the area beneath the scar which is healthy. So once we take off all the adhesions, post-operative, we want this area to grow glands. So we'll give high doses of estrogen and progesterone. Okay, so post-op, we can avoid the adhesions to form by putting, uh, you know, a copper tea we will put inside the uterus so that look if there is adhesion going to form, then the copper tea comes in the way and prevents the formation of the adhesions. You can use a multi-load also, any device which will prevent the uterine balls from touching each other again. You can use, put a copper tea and then you can add, you can even use a balloon, you know, you can use a Foley's balloon, uh, a small Foley's balloon and you can fill it up so that the cavity is distended a little bit and it uh, does not collapse on itself to form new additions. So you can use a Foley's balloon also for the purpose of preventing additions again. And what else do you do? You give high doses of estrogen and progesterone. Yes, very important. Estrogen and progesterone supplementation is given to make a new endometrium, to build a new endometrium. That's why we give estrogen and progesterone supplementation. All right. So that's the management of uh, Eschmann syndrome. Okay. We'll take the next question. Question number three. Which of the following modalities is used for the diagnosis of the placenta accreta? You know, it is actually known as the placenta accreta syndrome. You know, the placenta accreta syndrome is uh, uh, all these uh, type of placentas which are, uh, you know, very morbidly adhered to the uterine lining or they're invading into the uterine muscle like placenta increta or going through the uterine lining and coming to the serosa. So, that is the placenta percreta. So, yes, this is a syndrome which is going to make the patient bleed a lot. Know that very well. Because the uh, moment the patient delivers, we want to do the control cord traction and remove the placenta, but the placenta doesn't come out. Sometimes the cord snap and you would feel that, okay, it's a retained placenta, rush to the OT and do a manual removal of the placenta. But even that does not work. And uh, you see, when you're trying to do a manual removal, you are breaking the placenta into pieces. 
and uh, most of the plasma is still stuck to the uterine muscle. So that's when you get a surprise bleeding and mostly you end up uh, opening the patient and trying to salvage the uterus by doing very smart suturing. Some smart surgeons are able to save the uterus but mostly these uh, patients end up in a uh, obstetric hysterectomy and uh, it can be a life-threatening hemorrhage and so many times patients have lost their lives because of this plasma creatal syndromes. So it is best to diagnosis, uh, do a good diagnosis of this antenatally. So the best diagnosis is done by ultrasonography. So ultrasonography plus a color Doppler. That is what is used usually for the diagnosis of this plasma creta. And um, if this was a multiple choice, then I would say I would also add an MRI to this. And MRI is also a very good tool. When you have a doubt with ultrasonography, then you go to the troubleshooting equipment in imaging and that is magnetic resonance imaging. So if they've given you this choice, then I would say A and B are the best. So, uh, you know, I'm not uh, making all those uh, A plus B, A plus B plus C, all those choices I've not made. You want to know just the two choices, which are the answers here, right? So A and B are the good choices if they have a multiple choice so question based on this, all right? So the uh, basic thing about the development of the plasma creta syndrome, all of you know that uh, there is absence of the Nita Bush layer. You know that the placenta, when you want to remove the placenta after delivery, uh, suppose there's a placenta here. This placenta is attached to the uterus with a layer of fibrinoid necrosis here. So if this layer, the Nita Bush layer, if the Nita Bush layer is absent, that's what is the reason of the plasma being morbidly adhered to the uterine muscle. So total absence of the uh, destra basalis and imperfect development of the fibrinoid, that is the Nita Bush layer, that's the reason. Now the diagnosis is done by seeing the loss of the normal hypoechoic retroplasmal zone between placenta and the uterus. You know the area here, the area here you will see between the placenta and the uterus you will see a hypoechoic area. This area you will not see, there is loss of this hypoechoic area. There will be plastal vascular lacunae. There will be a lot of uh, you know, vascular lacunae in the plastal uh, vasculature here. You will see these, um, I will draw the plasma completely since there is absence of the Nita Bush layer. So now you will see this plastal vascular lacunae like this here. And uh, placenta bulging into the posterior bladder wall because yes, the placenta will have its uh, impression onto the bladder because it is going through the uterine muscle. So there will be a bulge into the bladder also. It's not invading into the bladder, but it will be bulging into the bladder. A full bladder generally when you use to do the ultrasound, you will see a bulge of the placenta into the bladder and there will be color Doppler abnormalities like I told you. Now, question number four. Ultrasound of a 10-week primary gravida shows a snowstorm appearance. Seriously, they asked you this question, is it? I think they wanted to give you some marks because I think the first thing you learn in uh, when you get into OBS and gynae in your third year, uh, you know, apart from knowing the antenatal examination of, you know, Leopold maneuvers and the, the next complicated thing, they, you know, uh, new thing you learn is about molar pregnancy. And molar pregnancy, they teach you snowstorm appearance. And uh, somebody told me that this question is uh, not going to come ever again because it is so easy. And uh, now that question is uh, coming all over again in her AIMS exam. I think uh, uh, they wanted to just test that. Uh, do you remember the age-old questions and the easy questions with the easy answers still or not? All right. So she was having fresh bleeding on PV. Her uterus was 12 weeks in size. What is the diagnosis? So yes, if you see that... Um, this is uh, ultrasound of uh, one of my patients here. I know the picture on the internet, uh, they are very much more uh, sensitive of the snowstorm appearance. Seriously, I mean, you have to really imagine that, you know, if you look at this area, you have to imagine that, uh, you know, you're looking uh, in a dark night, you're looking out of a window and you're seeing behind the black, uh, dark uh, background, you're seeing the snowflakes falling. So you have to very imaginative, but yes, snowstorm appearance is classical appearance of this uh, vasectomy more on the ultrasonography. And um, answer is B, obviously. And, uh, you know, this classical picture is seen in vesicular mole, but then sometimes it is not so easy to make out a vesicular mole by the ultrasonography. You will have to do a histopathological diagnosis by taking a, the, whatever you cure it out, you know, whatever you do uh, removal. Not exactly cure it out. That was a mistake. 
uh, we say whatever you evacuate. Uh, curettage is not to be done, you know, you don't do a DNC in a vesicular mole evacuation. Remember, the treatment of this is suction evacuation. You can do a check curettage, yes, that is correct, but the method is not to do a DNC. That is what is a mistake we all of us do sometimes. We classically say a suction evacuation. So, whatever you take out, you send it for the histopathological examination and that's where you make the diagnosis. Sometimes even there, it is not very easy. So, then we go and send this product for immunocytochemistry. Now, a blighted ovum is, uh, you know, it's an ultrasound. You will see the uterus uh, is having just a gestational sac and nothing else. You know, it will keep on growing on becoming bigger and bigger without any uh, fetal uh, node or uh, fetal, you know, limbs or nothing. You will see, you will not see a yolk sac, you will not see a fetal node, nothing. You will just see an empty gestation sac. So, it's actually more technically uh, and better called as a an embryonic gestation, an embryonic gestation. So, when we say blighted ovum, uh, that is a British nomenclature and uh, an embryonic gestation is the American nomenclature, both mean the same, okay? No confusion in that. And then missed abortion is that yes, you've seen a fetus, but now after two, three weeks of an ultrasound, you see a fetus uh, which was there in the ultrasound uh, earlier on. And after three weeks, you see, or maybe four weeks later, you see the fetus is crumpled, it is dead. And in these uh, three to four weeks, there was no pain, there was no bleeding, and there was nothing to say that the patient has already lost the fetus and it's a dead fetus inside. There was nothing to say. So that's why we say the uterus has missed an abortion or the gynecologist has missed an abortion because when you do the second ultrasound, you see a dead fetus inside and the uterus should actually expel a dead fetus. That did not happen. So that's what is a missed abortion and PCOS of course, you know, that we've discussed so many times. Ring of pearl or necklace of pearl appearance, small follicles, isn't it? Okay, so answer is uh, hyperform mole. Now, identify this instrument. Uh, seriously, very easy question again and this is the classical uh, Cusco's bivalve speculum and this is what is, uh, you know, very convenient instrument in the um, uh, OPD for us because if you want to examine the patient and then take a pap smear, I would want this Cusco speculum because it is self-retaining. It's got a lock on it. So, yes, it's a concave uh, speculum. You know, this, this surface is uh, the inner part is concave. So, it helps in, uh, you know, you open the vagina and see the concave surface. So, you can see more of the vagina because of concavity inside these blades. Distance between the two blades is adjustable. Now, that is a very uh, important uh, uh, information because see here, there is this screw here. If you loosen it, then you can increase this distance, you know, you can pull this up. So, if you can pull this up, then if there is a, you know, somewhat lax vagina, a multiparous woman, then you can sometimes if you have a small speculum and you open the vagina with the cuscos and you may not be able to see properly because of the vaginal walls might be falling uh, because of the laxity. So, then you can increase the height of this and you can see with the same uh, cusco speculum, you can see even in a lax perineum or a lax vagina. So, it is a very convenient uh, tool here that we have a adjusting screw here for the length between the two blades. And then once you uh, are able to open the speculum in the vagina, then suppose you want to do a pap smear, then you can keep it opened without using your uh, other hand, you know, you can just open it and screw this other nut here. So, if you screw this, then it will stay opened and stay fixed in the vagina. So, what is that benefit? That you can examine the patient alone. Uh, you don't need uh, another assistant, which is a problem with the sim speculum. Sim speculum, when you open with the sim speculum, uh, you need somebody to hold it and then only you can do a procedure. Although that's one of our favorite instruments, but if you want to examine and do a small procedure like taking a biopsy or doing a colposcopy, then a Cusco speculum comes more handy. So, uh, has a lock, self-retaining hence, used for small surgeries like a pap smear, cervical biopsy, IOCD insertion and removal and a colposcopy. So, that's the information which I wanted to give you. Now, the sim speculum, actually, this is that sim speculum. This is the most common speculum in the OPD. This is the, actually, the right hand of a gynecologist. In fact, the left hand of a right-handed gynecologist because you use your left hand to retract the vagina, use your other fingers to push the posterior vaginal wall and then you can inspect the cervix quickly in the OPD and find out, okay, fine, there's a problem or there's no problem or uh, somebody else can just, when you're opening the vagina, somebody can take a pap smear and... Uh, uh, take a cervical swab. This is that quick examination of a woman in the OPD 
and this is our favorite instrument for so many procedures and whatever you want to see inside the vagina, you want to inspect for infections, you want to inspect for tumors, same spectrum comes very handy. So it's called, uh, because of the shape of these uh, the blades, it's called a duck bill speculum. It's double ended and uh, obviously there are different sizes because uh, sometimes you may get uh, patients with different kind of anatomy. So there are two sizes on both the ends and uh, there's a trough in the speculum for, you know, if you're examining, then this trough in the speculum, you know, this part here, this, this is the trough, isn't it? So this trough is uh, uh, handy because uh, if there's some fluids or there's some blood, it'll just flow out on this trough. And uh, it, this trough is also helpful that sometimes there's a vesicovaginal fistula. When you use the speculum, some urine may uh, collect over this and that urine you can send for uh, analysis also. And um, this is that very favorite uh, instrument which we have in the opery for doing an examination. Another retractor I thought uh, which was there in the choices was Doins. This is the Doins retractor, the classical retractor which you interns have been using for uh, retracting the bladder while you are uh, seen as doing the cesarean sections, isn't it? So, this is that favorite instrument of the interns in Obs and Gynae, Doyne's retractor. Then, uh, Deaver's retractor, it's uh, the blade which is slightly uh, deeper, uh, you know, when it goes into the pelvis. So, when you're operating deep in the pelvis and you want to retract tissues so that you can, you know, you know, tying after doing the hysterectomy, uterus in itself is deep in the pelvis. When you do the hysterectomy, there's a wall to be closed. So that retraction, uh, you know, we want the divas because retraction in the depth is provided very nicely with this divas retractor. Okay, uh, recommended emergency contraceptive in India. I mean, did they really ask you India? I'm so uh, happy actually they asked you India because it removes a lot of confusion because they're asking you what is the drug of choice basically, but they just wrote India so that you don't mark Ulipristal. Because Ulipristal has been talked about a lot and everybody is saying it's the drug of choice and everybody has been saying that it is the new drug which is going to replace all the other methods. Maybe, maybe it is going to do all of that, but it's still not approved in the country for usage. And you know, everybody knows the, uh, the easiest method to prevent unwanted pregnancy after unplanned intercourse is to just walk across uh, to the pharmacy, buy a tablet which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, common trade name is iPill, but then you know it's Levonorgestrel pill of 1.5 milligrams and it is over the counter, you don't need a prescription and it can be a very handy tool because it prevents pregnancy in 95% cases if taken within 24 hours. So it's very effective that way. Uh, so yes, that is the drug of choice, Levonorgestrel. I hope uh, this uh, you know, takes away all that confusion which, uh, you know, AIMS exam comes out every year with two or three questions, uh, you know, INICT, I, sh I should say now, it comes out with uh, two or three questions which, uh, you know, all that um, effort which I take to explain you that, you know, why IUCD is not the method of choice and why Levonorgestrel is the method of choice. So, when a question like this comes, see, IUCD is not even the choices. So, please never say IUCD is the method of choice. It requires a doctor for the application and the patient cannot take it herself. So, it's not over the counter, isn't it? Yes, it is the most effective. I agree. IUCD is the most effective method. It can work 95% uh, throughout the five days after unplanned intercourse. That way, it's a very effective device. But the drug of choice, once again, reinforcement, thanks to AIMS. A couple of more questions have come like that, which have, uh, you know, reinforced what I've been trying to teach you so many, so many times in the app. So, yes, the drug of choice is levonorgestrel and uliprostol is not the drug here. Estrogen, yes, if you give high-dose estrogen, it's going to uh, make the endometrium proliferate rather than being uh, secretory for the implantation. So, this estrogen is given like, uh, uh, you know, uh, if there's a 30 microgram, then we give uh, four tablets at once when the patient comes and then after 12 hours, another four tablets. If it's a 50 microgram tablet, generally this is in combination uh, with the progesterone pill, that's a combined oral concentrated pill. So then we give uh, 50 micrograms, uh, then we give two tablets and then 12 hours later another two tablets. So yes, um, this estrogen, if you give, you can give it uh, just as estrogen also. You can give it as an estrogen and progesterone combination also. So this is known to cause a lot more uh, gastric discomfort and vomiting than levonorgestrel. So it's a good drug, but not the method of choice. And uh, uliprostol, yes, it can be used. Uh, selective progesterone receptor modulator can be used up to five days. Yes, it's coming up and uh, who knows, maybe in a couple of years, I'll be teaching you that it's the method of choice, but uh, not this year. And mesoprostol, yes, more used for abortion than for emergency conception. So yes, abortion is not a method used in emergency contraception. We know that very well. You can inhibit ovulation, you can inhibit implantation, you can reduce the tubal motility, 
but you can never cause an abortion because emergency conception is within 72 hours of unprotected sexual activity we say unprotected intercourse so within 72 hours you cannot even do an abortion if you want to do it because implantation takes place earliest on the sixth day after the intercourse even if suppose she's having intercourse let's say she was ovulating this day and she made an embryo the implantation happens earliest on the sixth day so you can do an abortion only on the seventh day even if you want to do it so if she comes to you as per definition within three days of unprotected intercourse you cannot do an abortion even if you want to okay ec within 72 hours of uh, uh, unprotected intercourse so abortion is not a method all right so let's move on question number seven which of the following is not a long acting and a reversible contraceptive lark all right long acting reversible contraception you know you can use implanon as a, a, a device as an implant and uh, it is long acting and it can be reversed at the end of this uh, duration you can remove it and the patient can have uh, you know conception again similarly levonorgestrel ivcd and copperty ivcd they are long acting uh, copperty uh, can be used for three to five years multi-load can be used for five years and uh, this one um, paragard can be used up to 10 years all of these devices you know they are long acting but then they can be removed and the patient can have conception but what is not reversible classically is sterilization another easy question if you sterilize a man or a woman then he or she is completely sterilized no chances of having a pregnancy provided you do it properly then uh, you say that this is a non-reversible method okay so yes uh, this tubal sterilization is that uh, uh, method of uh, uh, you know permanent permanent non-reversible now uh, i mean if you do a tubectomy and uh, do it properly then of course the woman will never conceive but then let's try to you know tell you a bit further that yes if uh, technically if she says that okay i've had a sterilization with you and uh, now my husband has separated from me and he's taken away my children so i feel i want uh, to have more pregnancies because i'm marrying again and i'm only 35 years so i would want to have a pregnancy again so i can actually reverse this procedure by a surgery by itself it is not reversible so yes it is a non-reversible method but yes you some of you may ask that uh, can't you reverse a tubectomy you can reverse a tubectomy but that requires a, uh, a good surgical skill to do that procedure uh, to take off this uh, ligation and uh, freshen the edges up and then join them again what is the length of the tube required after a reanastomosis to be called a good tube at least four centimeters okay post recanalization at least four centimeters okay i'll not dwell more into that i think one of my favorite topics about reanastomosis i think we'll move on now and get into the next question dose of carbidocin used in pth management is uh, so yes uh, we are used to uh, talking about oxytocin and uh, methyl ergometrin and carboprost and you know that carboprost and mesoprostol are the drugs which are generally asked of you people in the exams but then they've asked you a different drug this time so yes carbitocin is uh, given uh, intravenous and intramuscular both it can be given intramuscular also uh, this acts fast this takes time but then uh, slower onset obviously but then it is uh, benefit of im is that it is longer effect it's got a longer effect and carbitocin is a um, you know synthetic analog of uh, oxytocin and uh, this carbitocin the benefit is that it is um, longer action if you use intravenous oxytocin uh, the action would be say for around five minutes but then carbitocin the action can be almost 10 times you know it can be around uh, 40 to 50 minutes the action of carbitocin so that way this is a much better drug when we are using so it is given mostly iv but you can give it im also um, my preferred would be you know if the bleeding is not too much and you just want to you know give an injection and go off and writing the notes and take care of the other patient in the labor room give carbitocin im because 
you know, the bleeding has stopped. I mean, the patient has delivered, there's not much bleeding, give IM cabitocin so that the action of uterus uh, uh, contractions, you know, the uterine tetany which is achieved by cabitocin will be for good around 5-6 hours because of an IM cabitocin. So that way, when that kind of contraction is there, you know, she's not going to bleed. After 5-6 hours, she's not going to bleed in the ward. The uterus is not going to distend and start bleeding until something drastic happens. So my uh, preferred method is to give it IM, but yes, They've asked you what is the method of giving carbitocin in PPS management. I would give it IV. Ideally, of course, it is given ideally IV. And IV is given as 100 mil uh, micrograms in 1 ml as a bolus over 1 minute. So 100 micrograms over 1 minute in 1 ml. Okay. And um, it's a synthetic oxytocin analog. I told that information already to you. Question number 9. Match the columns. Yes, uh, they are asking us the ovarian tumors and the tumor markers and uh, I thought this was uh, a good exercise in remembering all the tumor markers for us. So, dysgeminoma would be LDH, yes, dysgeminoma also increases the uh, plasminal alkaline phosphatase but remember it does not increase alpha fetoprotein, that's one thing you should remember, dysgeminoma not alpha fetoprotein. So, dysgeminoma A here would come here, then epithelial cell tumor. B would go for the CA125, as simple as that. That's the easy one. And uh, the granulosa cell tumor, you know, granulosa cell tumor, if it is there, it is known to make a lot of estrogens. A lot of estrogen means that um, there is uh, going to be, suppose it's in a young girl uh, of around 6-7 years, if she's got a granulosa cell tumor, that is going to give a precocious puberty. High estrogens is going to make her endometrium grow. And if it is in a woman, um, you know, the woman who is menstruating normally, because of granulosa cell tumor, she can have menorrhagia and uh, too much of endometrium can also uh, predispose that patient to have endometrial cancer. So, a lot of estrogen by granulosa cell tumor, but then the marker is not estrogen because estrogen can be made by many other sources. It can be made in the periphery also. So, the marker of granulosa cell tumor is not estrogen, it is inhibin. Okay, and uh, core carcinoma, choice D, that is straightforward, we'll go with beta HCG. And yolk sac tumor increases the alpha fetoprotein. So, this is fairly simple A4, uh, A4, B5, and uh, C1, and uh, D3, and E2. So, yes, A is the answer here. Um, fairly simple. Yolk sac tumor specifically, what does it increase? It specifically increases the alpha 1 antitrypsin. All right. Also, this yolk sac tumor is also known as AKA, also known as the endodermal, endodermal sinus tumor, okay. Right, so let's see, double bleb sign is seen in the ultrasound and what is it suggestive of? So, double bleb sign, of course, it's, um, you know, some of the signs which are there for the early diagnosis of pregnancy, there are a lot of uh, sonographic signs and one of them is the double bleb sign, two blebs you see. So, in this picture of one of my patients, I'm trying to show you here, two blebs, uh, you have to be a little bit, uh, I mean, just focus here if you can, you can see the yolk sac here easily, this one you can see very easily, but then I'm trying to show you another part here and that is from the fetus, you see there's a thin line going like this, can you see there's a thin line going like this, I'll remove it now so that you can see, yes, there's a thin line. Uh, some patients it's seen very nicely that is actually the yolk sac so that is what is the double bleb sign uh, quite a few ultrasound you see this very clearly so but I have to show you my uh, you know patients and my pictures uh, I cannot be showing you work uh, which is there on the internet isn't it so when you see this picture you will see one sac of the amnion another sac of the yolk sac so the amnion and the yolk sac is what is the double bleb sign fairly advanced pregnancy here you can see around the seventh week uh, onwards there can be an event which is being shown here uh, this question is over I mean the answer of question number 10 is B amniotic sac and the yolk sac it is seen within the gestational sac you know this is the gestational sac here so that is the double bleb sign I'm trying to show you uh, something here there's an event here which is happening if you try and imagine that from the amniotic sac can you see here from this uh, blue amniotic sac, this yellow, the yolk sac is coming out. Now, that is going to happen around the 7th uh, e uh, or 7th week onwards that from the amniotic sac, I am trying to show you here, 
this uh, with my finger I'm making the amniotic sac and this I'm showing you that the yolk sac which is inside the amniotic sac so far is now going to come to the edge and then it's going to get pinched out you know it's going to get pinched out of the amniotic sac so that's what is happening here this yolk sac is getting pinched out now this is a, a you know sometimes we've seen this happening while an ultrasound is going on so it's not a very uh, you know a rapid moment it takes much time but then occasionally we've seen the ultrasound in the morning and then suppose you do the ultrasound a little bit later say around two or three hours later you'll see that the yolk sac is away from the amniotic sac so that pinching out is one event which you should be aware of now question number 11 in a young female with facial hair presented uh, with facial hair i mean i think they want to say prominent facial hair uh, a woman a young woman with uh, prominent facial hair presented with features of pcos line of management here is now pcos line of management is uh, uh, you know multidisciplinary you have to take care of not just of the facial hair you must take care of uh, obesity so that when she loses her weight she can ovulate better because insulin resistance will reduce i mean uh, the insulin sensitivity will increase if she loses her weight and uh, lifestyle modifications along with that she should take drugs for regularizing the cycles like combined pills and if she wants to conceive then we have to give a clomphene citrate or letrozole for the ovulation induction so yes uh, line of management here with a young female would be of course, she doesn't want to get pregnant now. So, young female, lifestyle management to lose weight, antiandrogens for the facial hair and OCPs for the regular cycles. So, that is the initial management which you want to do to a young lady. Uh, laparoscopic over drilling is the resistant cases. In resistant cases, which do not respond to any management. I mean, you've done the ovulation induction, suppose, and you're trying to give her a clomphenicitride, letrozole, you've given a recombinant FSH and she's not ovulating and she's not responding to all your management uh, methods, resistant cases, then we sometimes start add, adding a lot of metformin high dose, even then she's not responding, then we say there's a local cause, you know, systemically you're giving enough stimulation, but the ovary locally is not having the right milieu, it is not having the right environment. So what do you do? You reduce the androgenic content of the ovary by doing the laparoscopic ovary drilling. So in this ovary, there are these multiple small follicles and there is this thick stroma. The thick stroma, you can put in a laparoscopic procedure, you can put in a cautery, a electrocautery is used to burn this stroma. We burn this stroma in four holes Classically four rolls, but four to six rolls most people would make. You burn the stroma repeatedly. I've told you in the PCOS uh, discussions video also. You burn the stroma, not the uh, follicles. Okay, you burn the stroma. So when you burn the stroma, this the stromal androgens will reduce, and the local follicles become more responsive to your management. Okay, so the answer is A, B, and C. We'll move on to the next one. Question number twelve. Calculate Bishop's score for the following findings when a per vaginal examination was done for a woman at 37 weeks. Cervix was 1 cm, posterior soft, 30% effaced and station was at minus 1. So yes, you know that Bishop's score is to tell you the favorability of the cervix, uh, whether it can uh, open easily and whether the patient can go into labor easily or you may have to use drugs for priming the cervix. All that is based on the Bishop score. So a good Bishop score we've always maintained is more than equal to 9, easy to deliver. And a poor score, this is good. And a poor score is less than or equal to 4. That means a Bishop score is very bad. She is not likely to deliver in the next one week at least. So less than 4 is bad. More than 9, uh, more than equal to 9 is good. Between 5 to 8, we can try and use some of our drugs to make the cervix softer so that it opens so that's where the obstetrician comes in. Less than four, you really have to try hard to. There are a lot of methods of induction of uh, labor. We shall be discussing that in a separate forum. But then less than four is really difficult for the patient to, you know, go ahead and deliver now because uh, suppose there's indication she's got a severe PIH and you want to do a normal delivery, then less than four centimeter will take a lot more effort from us to open it up. So yes, uh, we must know the Bishop score in detail now. Uh, that's what is coming in the exams. So the Bishop score is the findings of the cervix and one finding of the head, that is the station of the head. So there are four findings for the cervix. One is the dilatation, 
So 0, 1, 2, 3 based on whether it's closed, 1 to 2, 3 to 4 or more than 5 centimeters dilated. Effacement, uh, whether it's 0 to 30 percent, 40 to 50 percent, 60 to 70, more than 80. Uh, consistency firm, medium, soft, position, posterior, medium, anterior. So, you know, based on this, we get the Bishop score. But now, we always use the effacement. Uh, there was a lot of talk of using the cervical length now. But then Ames again has, uh, you know, this uh, INICT exam has again cleared the confusion that they have given 30% effaced. They have not asked you in centimeters. So you don't have to remove that. Uh, here onwards, even in the app, I'm going to change it all to percentage because uh, they don't really tell us what they want because most people use percentage. We still use percentage effacement. But some recommendations keep coming from so many bodies and people say that you must talk about the length. Now we're not going to talk about length because... This INICT exam is Jipmer, Ames and PGI, the best brains in the, in the country and they are going to ask you about effacement. So we are going to teach you effacement which is what we do also in the uh, labor rooms. So effacement is, uh, they have said 30 so that is going to give 0 marks and then the cervix is 1 centimeter dilated that is going to give just 1 mark here. Effacement was 30, cervix was 1 centimeter and then um, it is posterior but it is soft. So post is going to give nothing. But if it is soft, it's going to give two marks. And uh, station is at minus one, it's going to give again two marks. So two marks here, two marks here, and one mark here, and zero and zero here. So we're going to have a bishops of five. So we actually have to mark it up. Okay. Uh, take your time and uh, have a good read at this. So WHO guidelines for management of second stage of labor. You've been reading a lot about the active management of third stage of labor. So here we are going to change the question and ask you second stage now and uh, slightly um, you know off the routine but then these are also questions which you should know. Now WHO was asked or not that is where I am a little stuck because WHO comes out with guidelines uh, every 45 minutes. No, let's not say that. They'll get angry if I say that. So, WHO comes out with guidelines so frequently that it's very difficult to keep up with all the recommendations which come. And uh, frankly, obstetricians in the country, we follow WHO, but not blindly. WHO is important for us. So, when they ask WHO guidelines, we have to remember that some guidelines which are pertinent and can be easily implemented in our country, we will use them. For example, when do we start charting the partogram? Yes, in the active stage of labor. And when is active stage of labor? 4 centimeters. That was the question in INICT last year. 4 centimeters was the answer. WHO says 5 centimeters. American College says 6 centimeters. So, if you strictly go by WHO, then you can't actually answer anything. So, I would always say all you interns who are working in the government colleges, you are the best to tell even the friends who are working in the private colleges that yes, in our college so far, the partograms are still at 4 centimeters. I have discussed this with a lot of people. So WHO recommendations, yes, they are important, but not all of them are uh, followed blindly. That is why I asked you whether WHO was written. So if WHO was written, my question answer is going to be a little different from what I actually practice. So let me just tell you, for second stage of labor, routine episiotomy, absolutely not. We will give episiotomy only if there is a big baby. So episiotomy is given for a big baby. If you know there is a macrosomia or if there is a breach or if I am going to do an instrument, okay, or if there is a, you know, a shoulder dystocia, something like that. Apart from that, the, you know, primary gravidas give episiotomy, there is no such rule, okay. Uh, but be careful to prevent the tear in especially primary gravidas when the, you know, the anatomy has not uh, yet been uh, given the test of a delivery, then that uh, vaginal anatomy can get destroyed very easily, it can tear. So we should make efforts to make it soft and supple and uh, make sure that when it stretches, it doesn't tear. So to prevent that, we can use a warm compress on the perineum and we can gently massage the perineal body and massage the muscles so that they uh, stretch while the head is coming out. So yes, that is done. We make the perineum a little soft, we stretch it a little so that when the head comes, it does not uh, tear the perineum while the delivery is happening and we do not really have to. We, obstetrics is a science where you have to sit, you know, you have to sit in front of the perineum and make sure that she delivers. You, uh, what is the meaning of obstetrics? Stand before a parturient. That is the meaning of obstetrics. So you have to put those hard hours, you know, you have to go the hard yards 
you have to sit with the patient and make the deliver. So, you know, it's very easy to do a cesarean. Then it's not really obstetrics, isn't it? It is just learning a cesarean, which you can learn if you assess just five procedures. Obstetrics, where you have to make sure a woman delivers normally without an episiotomy. You have to make sure the perineum is soft and it is stretchable easily when the head is coming down. So, we do that warm compress in the perineum. We use some lubricants to soften the vagina a little bit and it stretches without tearing. Now, delivering lithotomy, that is not a necessity. She can deliver up upright if she wants. She can deliver in supine if she is comfortable. Whatever is comfortable for the patient is what is the uh, best position for her. So, that is not a necessity. Now, the problem is that the answer to this question is B because WHO is asked and WHO is not very happy about the Ridgen uh, maneuver. You know, Ridgen maneuver where we, you know, put our, our fingers uh, on the perineum, but we go and try and reach the fetal chin through the perineum. You know, we go through the fetal chin and do a little bit of deflection so that, you know, the head delivers by extension. So, you help that by deflexing the head and doing a little bit of extension so that the smaller diameters are used when the baby's head is coming out. So, we do the region maneuver, it is taught to all of you, but WHO is not happy with that. If you say WHO, then deflection of the head or extension of the head, this is not done. So, by WHO, the answer to this question is B. You ask me, I do region maneuver for all my patients. It helps to deliver the head properly and of course, perineal support is correct. This is correct even by WHO. So, maybe the choices are not recalled properly in this one. But yes, we've learned about things now that uh, we would not do the rigid maneuver or the deflection of the head if you go strictly by WHO. Otherwise, if you go by an obstetrician who's been working all his life in the labor room, then you would do the rigid maneuver. It helps. Okay. So, the answer to the question specifically, WHO guidelines for management of second stage of labor, you give warm compress on the perineum and stretch the perineum with some lubrication so that the perineum doesn't descend to suddenly and tear while the delivery is happening because routine episiotomy is not done. So, answer is B by the question which was given to me. Okay. So, yes, this is what I am trying to tell you here. The position can be upright. It can be sitting, kneeling, squatting, resting at 30 degrees, whatever position she is comfortable. Or if she is not upright, she can be lithotomy and supine. Is the patient's choice. You don't really have to force a lithotomy on a patient. She can deliver. Uh, you know, a lot of people want to deliver squatting. And that's what you've seen as interns in the labor rooms. And so many times the patients get up while they're in labor and they're very angry. They're not listening to you. And that's the fun part of labor room, you know, as long as she's not getting hurt. You know, she would want to go to the loo. She's repeatedly saying that I feel like uh, passing stools. But actually, it's the sensation of the head, uh, you know, trying to come out of the perineum and uh, pressing on the uh, rectum. So, yes, she gets the sensation of passing stools. She goes to the loo, especially the Indian loo. And she delivers there. Hmm, I'm sure you've seen that happening or you've heard about it happening. We've seen that happening many times. And we have done deliveries in the loose also. Yes, it does happen. That's why I said that's the fun part of uh, obstetrics. And uh, if you don't like obstetrics, then uh, you will never like anything what I've told you, isn't it? All right. Clear cell carcinoma is what uh, type of ovarian cancer? Now, this is one question which uh, came away from the normal because mostly the most common ovarian cancer is the epithelial ovarian cancer. We know that. And in epithelial ovarian cancer, the most common is the serous cyst adenoma or the serous cyst adenocarcinoma. And uh, we know that uh, is what is the regular question. But then they asked you epithelial ovarian cancer uh, of the clear cell type. So, yes, the answer is epithelial cell tumor. It's the classification which you have to know. And uh, germ cell tumors are like the disc germinoma, the teratoma, uh, which can be malignant in 10%, uh, benign in 90%, which is known as the dermoid and sex cord tumor, like what we discussed just now, the granulosa cell tumor, you know, the sex cords of a person which gives the sexual expression and then lady cell tumors, Sertoli cell tumors and granulosa cell tumor is again a sex cord tumor. So, the choice may be not the best one. Sex cord tumor is a granulosa cell tumor. Never mind. Uh, clear cell is a epithelial cell tumor here and um, the choices of the Epithelial tumors, the serous, mucinous, endometroid, clear cell, Brenner, mixed epithelial, undifferentiated. These are the types of epithelial tumors which we see. And clear cell is uh, not more than 5% of the tumors. So, rare tumor to ask in an MCQ exam. So, if you've just gone through the list sometimes of the epithelial tumors and, uh, you know, PATH people also teach you this and uh, it's there in the gynae books. Uh, so, yes, I have not really taught you clear cell tumors of the ovary because they are rarities. So, if you start teaching everything in Hobbes and Gynae, 
then that's going to be a lot of notes and a lot of hours on the videos. So yes, if you've gone through the path classification and you've seen your books, then you would have, uh, you know, maybe seen this clear cell tumor as a type of epithelial tumor. Right, it is less than 5% of the ovarian cancers and the appearance is that abundant clear or vacuolated cytoplasm, hyperchromatic irregular nuclei and nuclei of various sizes. That's what is the uh, microscopic appearance and uh, clear cell tumors are associated with endometriosis. Now that's one thing which may be the next year's question. Okay, a 19 year old girl with amenorrhea, normal pubic hair and normal breast development. So um, she's uh, looking normal, but she comes and says, sir, I'm not having periods. So, I mean, they're trying to say that uh, it's not androgen insensitivity because pubic hair is there. So it's not testicular feminization syndrome and it's not gonadal dysgenesis also because uh, in gonadal dysgenesis, like say for Turner syndrome, the breast development is not there. So common gonadal dysgenesis is the Turner syndrome, isn't it? So the height is also short and uh, pubic hair is also not so uh, dense. So that's why we say that it could be gonadal dysgenesis, but this patient is not having that problem because she's got a normal breast development here. So I would uh, say it's a straightforward case of a woman having perfect development of all the bodily uh, habitus, but that the uterus is not formed. So we say it's a Mullerian agenesis. Now Mullerian agenesis is also known as the mayor Rokitansky kusner hauser syndrome. So that's why you keep getting this MRKH thing in your exam sometimes. All right. So answer is A. Question number 16. Gestation diabetes mellitus in pregnancy single step. That is, you know, nowadays uh, we do the one step, single step or one step like that it comes in the exam. And uh, I'm so happy that uh, the uh, INICT exam is sticking with what I've taught you that uh, again, you know, uh, things which uh, uh, no longer is a confusion for me when I take your classes that we don't use the glucose challenge test, we don't use the glucose tolerance test, next step uh, challenge test with the, uh, you know, 50 grams of glucose and if that is abnormal then we use 100 grams of glucose, that is two steps. So we like to do that one step now so that as and when the patients come to the OPD, we just do today when she's fasting, just do in one go and we don't have to call her again for the diagnosis. So yes, the ADA recommended values are that the fasting levels should be less than 92, then it gives 75 grams of glucose, and then one hour should be less than 180 and two hours, two, it's not 11, one hour, two hour, should be less than 153. So yes, uh, not the easiest levels to remember, but then that's how it is. You must uh, mug up these levels because it's very frequently coming in the exams. So single step cutoff value for fasting blood sugar is 92. And uh, mind you guys, I specifically marked less than 92 here. Please see this. It's not just 92, it is less than 92. If it is 92, I put the woman on a diet. Yes, 92 is bad, less than 92 is normal. Okay, so just a slight variation from what was given in the choices. Question number 17, uh, uh, this question I think uh, was from the physiology uh, uh, part of the equation, but then yes, uh, we would also be happy to take this question in our discussion. Mill suppression in pregnancy is brought about by which of the following? Uh, you know, um, there is a very simple fact here to remember that um, milk production, prolactin and milk let down oxytocin after delivery. And uh, we always say that the prolactin is very high in pregnancy, but after delivery, it actually goes down to the normal levels, pre-pregnant levels. And in fact, some books say that it is less than normal also. And there is an episodic rise. There's an episodic rise of prolactin when the child is suckling on the mother. So that's the time when the prolactin increases after delivery. And during pregnancy, it's high throughout. So if the prolactin is high, she should be lactating. She should be lactating even during the pregnancy, isn't it? But yes. A lot of hormones apart from prolactin are playing the part while the pregnancy is going on and those are the progesterones and estrogens. The choice given here is only estrogen. So I was a little uh, upset here that why just estrogen is given but then yes, the other two don't uh, fall in place. So I would say yes, the answer to the question here, milk suppression is because of the high estrogen levels. Uh, more appropriate would have been high progesterone first plus the high estrogens. If they were given this choice, I would have been happy. Was this a choice? Do write to me and tell me was uh, progesteron given as a choice. But then in this, the answer is B. And then uh, the removal of progesterone suppression. 
you know, the progesterone separation of the alpha lacta albumin production, that's what is the main cause for the inhibition of milk production while the patient is uh, having the pregnancy. So, this removal of progesterone separation, progesterone inhibition is taken off and uh, prolactin stimulates the alpha lacta albumin production. So, that's why all of these events they play in tandem to make the woman have the uh, milk uh, production after delivery. So, the withdrawal, the main event, uh, we say that uh, we've been discussing about this so many times that uh, what uh, caused the milk letdown, what caused the milk production. But one of the events which we keep forgetting is that the withdrawal of the progesterone in estrogen is that first event, you know, that initiating event which is happening after delivery, which is helping the patient to have the milk production. Okay. So, best treatment for osteoporosis for a woman of 60 years. Now, this is what I have been discussing uh, so many times in our uh, discussions on the videos that yes, what is the drug of choice for osteoporosis management and I have been you know shouting hoarse that uh, we have to think in terms of estrogens because we are talking of hormone replacement therapy. So, when you talk of HRT for the treatment of osteoporosis, so we have to talk of a hormone first. So, yes, uh, all studies which were done for the prevention of osteoporosis and the major study was the woman health initiative study which said that we should give estrogens for the prevention and treatment of osteoporosis moment a woman gets into menopause. So, that is indeed the drug of choice and now just to uh, make uh, this very clear the INICT uh, people have come with a question that they have asked you a specific uh, question that at 60 years and beyond what is the drug of choice. So, that is what we have been telling you so many places that yes. After 60 years, that is 50 to 60, 10 years you give given estrogens. Beyond 10 years, if you give estrogens, it can cause coronary artery disease. So, yes, for prevention, treatment, osteoporosis, estrogen, but we cannot give it for more than 10 years. So, late onset osteoporosis, late onset osteoporosis, 60 years and beyond, give bisphosphonates. So, that is the question also which has come in the exam now, that yes, the treatment for this woman is bisphosphonates. Yes, I agree, at 60 years and beyond. So, yes, this is what is uh, given in all your books also. If you see Shaw's gynecology, osteoporosis, the information given up front is very simple that yes, uh, natural estrogen, progesterone, tibolone, reloxifene are beneficial in osteoporosis if it occurs early in menopause. Osteoporosis occurring late in menopause benefits from bisphosphonates. Okay, and then uh, again, there is given this statement here that. It is recommended that HRT should be prescribed in early menopause for the treatment of osteoporosis, bisphosphonate section. They are saying clearly that HRT should be given. Again, in the bisphosphonate chapter also, they are saying that the HRT should be given for prevention of the osteoporosis in menopause. After 60 years, osteoporosis should be managed with bisphosphonates. Okay, and this is that uh, study which I have been telling you from Novak's uh, gynecology about the Women Health Initiative trial. Okay, so H hormone treatment, HT, hormone treatment effectively prevents and treats osteoporosis and is FDA approved for the treatment of osteoporosis and prevention. And then the next line in blue, the WHI trial confirmed a significant 34% reduction in hip fractures in healthy women randomized to hormonal treatment. Okay, I think I will not show you many more, uh, uh, you know, evidences of uh, this because INICT itself has asked you a question about 60 years and the answer is correct that you have to use bisphosphonates. Now, dose of dexamethasone for accelerating fetal lung maturity, a fairly simple question. It is uh, an often repeated question in the INICT and that is whether you give dexamethasone or betamethasone. They have stopped that discussion altogether. Mostly the question asked about dexamethasone. But mind you, dexa is just as good as beta and they can be used interchangeably. And um, what is the dosage of dexamethasone? Yes, the doses is four times you have to give and you have to give 6 milligram. So, that you have to give 24 mg. So, 6 milligram, 12 hourly, four doses. That's the answer here. And when you give betamethasone also, that is given 12 milligrams, 24 hourly into two doses. So, that is also 12 into 2, 24 milligrams, all right. So, both these drugs are given and uh, these are the steroids which are given for the 
uh, accelerating the lung maturity if a baby is about to deliver, you know, in preterm labor, or you're going to conduct a delivery because the uh, baby is under some risk. And so suppose you're going to do a cesarean day after tomorrow and you want the lung to get mature in this time at 32 weeks. So give beta metazone or dexamethasone, and dexamethasone dose has been asked. So how do steroids help? How do steroids help getting the lung mature? Have you asked that question to yourself? Yes, these steroids are going to, uh, they are given to the mother. So when they reach the fetus, they're going to promote fatty acid synthesis. And fat production is what is going to promote the lung maturity. So yes, I've been telling you this in the app, that yes, the lung maturity is all about fats. So if the lungs have the best fats, like the phosphatidylcholine, then the lung is going to be soft and smooth, the alveoli, and they're going to expand with the uh, respiration. So for that softness, we need fats, and fat production happens best after 34 weeks. So the lung is mature, we say, till 34 weeks, that is what is precise. Till 34 weeks, the lung is mature because of fat production. But in case it is not happening, we can accelerate the fatty acid production by giving steroids. Now, the steroids reach the baby through the mother. Give the steroids to the mother, reach the baby, increase fatty acid production, and the lungs get mature. I'm sure most of you knew that. But uh, good revision is always helpful. And uh, that was that question which came in the exams. Answer was C. You know, surprised that uh, this time they asked you a lot of routine questions, but uh, three, four questions which were a little away from normal. But then, yes, that's the fun part of reading, that there is always something new to read. So keep reading very hard. And all the best for all your exams which are coming. And God bless you. <music>